pay attention though. All right, here we go. Here we go. The modern world. Oh, I gotta say this first, right? Because I'm gonna be trying to use this. Um, yeah. So this is a what if alt hist for what if alt hist video. He uh, he does a lot of stuff about stuff that really overlaps with cultural anthropology. So, uh, you know, I'll record an intro after I do it. Ridiculously rich by any center in history, but people are still deeply unhappy. I think a good deal of this comes from a lack of a coherent ideology or religion that makes life worth living, and second is lack of community. Much of the modern population goes to work, doesn't really have any friends or social connections, and think their lives are meaningless and are terrified of dying. They try to direct... Hey, one thing that he does, I think, is like he really almost projects or something. Um, he like... It seems like these are very Gen Z. I don't know if he just said Gen Z, but it's very Gen Z issues that he has, and the but you know, that, that's okay. It's uh, he's generalizing things for a narrative, which is honestly, it's fine. I guess if you don't agree with it and it doesn't resonate with you, then you just, you just won't watch it. Um, all right. I'm sharing the right screen. Derive meaning from stuff like politics or pop culture with often horrifying and depressing effects. This can't last forever. Humans are inherently believing creatures. Every era of history has either been deeply religious or ideological. This video will look at each of the main civilizations in the world today and try to explain oh. their current ideological hey, or religious up, struggles man? and then predict in what direction they're moving in and what that means for the future and how that'll turn out. I'm going to make a future video predicting religions I think will develop in the further future at some later point. Okay. Yeah, no, the prospects are very bad for younger people. Um, how you doing, man? Nice to see you. There's usually more people here, but I just started and uh, it's late. I Obesity is an epidemic in the modern world, with two thirds of Americans being obese and two billion people around the world. This is where our sponsor Noom comes in. Okay. Noom's an app. That I'm just gonna skip ahead here. Yeah, one of my um, one of my one of my patrons uh, asked me to do an episode on obesity. I'm gonna be doing that soon. Um, the obesity in America is, is heavily connected to culture. Just, you know, that's off of this ad, but that, that's an important thing because it really is, a, it, it shows a manifestation of a lot of things wrong with, with our culture when people are allowed to get to that level of unhealthiness. And it, it also shows the level of decadence and um, the disconnection from human activities, things that uh, in the past would have just been what you did with your with your life just to survive. And, and uh, in the past, just doing the things you needed to do to survive would would meet your basic human needs. Um, you might be mal malnourished, especially if you were uh, an earlier farmer or a poor peasant at most times in history. But um, but you would likely be more fulfilled than most people today. And uh, I guess that's why we're here. Out. On one side, I'd love to get into the nitty gritty of every part of the world, but sadly, this video has to be an overview due to length. On the other side, generalizing that the whole world gets really silly, and instead, this video is going to focus on different regions of the world in different parts, like Europe, China, India, etc. And even on this really big scale, I'm going to have to move a mile a minute. There are other parts of the world I'm just not going to talk about, largely because I don't know enough about their current ideological uh. struggles to really give a accurate or plausible picture of where they're at now. For example, I don't see Latin America making massive strides in the near future, and I think they'll just continue their pattern of looting between right and left wing kleptocrats. I could see Protestantism gaining more- I mean, he just says that. He doesn't say any reason why, but I mean, that's okay. Um, there are a number of reasons why, why I believe that. Uh, lots of good work by Francis Fukuyama, not Robert Kiyosaki, two Japanese American artists that I sometimes screw up. I did that on Good Old Boys show. I uh, I said Robert Kiyosaki, very different authors, both Japanese American. More ground in Africa as well, but I'm not informed enough about what's going on on the ground to really give you a good answer. Yeah, right here, this band, the band of the Sahel. I mean, you can see just the the difference, and this is why geography, I think, is something that we don't talk about enough. Is that there's a lot of stuff in geography which is such a simple field, I think, and almost looked down upon in 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 the social studies and the humanities subjects, but you know, just even though it's very simple, it's it's simple for a reason. There's lots of good stuff in there. Um, I should do some geography for Africa's ideological. But this is a natural barrier. Something here else to keep in mind is the map. definition of religion. Religion in a Durkheimian sense carries four main variables, one of which is ritual, the second community, the third, a sense of ethics, like what is right and wrong in life. Yeah. You know, I've done a bunch of episodes on this if you see my stuff, but obviously check out the podcast. But uh, the definition of religion is really important and defining religion is in itself um, a socially constructed idea. So it's created by humans, defining what exactly a religion is. And this is why the definitions of religion 
in the West don't necessarily work well with religions of the East and of other places, but especially of the East. And the fourth is metaphysics, or what is my place in the world? Not all religions even need to have God. Parts of Confucianism and Buddhism don't. But religions need to have those four things. Well, East Asia is interesting. In that we'll, we'll go with that working definition. Portrays the closest thing to an ideological void that the modern world has. The line between religion and irreligion in this part of the world is already weak given Buddhism and Confucianism are in some ways atheist religions, as is communism. Well, Shinto and Taoism are basically collective. Um, Cleveland. Um, Cleveland's my edit word, by the way. I'm just going to, I'll just address you for a second and I'll go back in. So do you usually go with the Durkheim definition or something else for religion? So the uh, Emil Durkheim is, I don't know if you, you were familiar with him before this, but um, his definition is very good for religion, but I've, I've done a number of, of different ones. I, I could jump back in my notes, but Durkheim's full definition is is as follows. I'll read it to you. A religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, that is to say, things set apart and forbidden, beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community called a church, all those who adhere to them. So this is one of my favorite definitions. Um, but whenever like taught going to any sort of in-depth study into the anthropology of religion. Um, I definitely feel that you should use multiple definitions to to see the differences between them. But Emil Durkheim's definitions, what you have to do is then break down what those individual words mean, which is something I did in, I think, maybe episode 40 or 41 of my podcast. Um, no, no, it's totally fine, man. The streams are totally casual. I'm literally just trying to learn how to use this equipment. Um I got a lot of I got a lot of stuff to do and I'm like on the way to monetization on YouTube so I'm I'm doing them super casual I'm just interacting with people as much as I can and trying out um different stuff and, and getting familiar because I'm not good with the tech um but yeah this is the point the point is you know people come and ask me questions and it's it's awesome that you're here you know I'm a, I'm a fan of your stuff I know we've interacted a little bit um but yeah Durkheim's definition I think is the best one it is um it's a great definition uh it's it's the it's the most prominent one, but there are two others that, that are in there um, that I would use sometimes. Yeah, I'll get back into this. I, I love talking about Eastern stuff as well. Okay, Cleveland, going back in. And welcome, whoever else joined. Collections of pre-existing folkways. You really struggle to find religion in the strict Abrahamic sense that dominates much of the rest of the world here. Also, a combination of being thoroughly crushed by the Western powers, which weaken their millennia-long senses of cultural superiority, Sorry to interrupt this again, but if you go on my, I, I love East Asia. If you go on my podcast feed, there is a two hour episode of me with the guys from Biting the Bullet talking about the culture of, uh, of China, of East Asia and its prominence in the world. Starting with about half of it, talking about ancient history up until the Opium Wars. And then the next hour talking about the, the culture relative to today. The alongside communism killed religion here. This is where the vast majority of the world's atheists are concentrated. Although the numbers might get skewed by lots of Europeans who are really atheists, but mark religious for cultural reasons. In the wealthier yeah. countries like Japan or Korea, I, like the wealthier Western nations, we strange... Just because you say you're religious doesn't mean you aren't religious, okay? Like, uh, the, the human being is a being that worships. And if you, if you don't choose what you worship, what you worship will be chosen for you in certain ways. And you can call it whatever you want. The Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. You can call it not religious. You can pretend you're not religious. I'm not talking to you guys. All my followers are Catholics and Orthodox mostly, but it's, it's, um, <laughs> I digress too much. Um, the, it, it, you're still religious. You're, you're still doing those things that, you know, they're, if once you start trying to name them, you know, it, it goes into the realm of man and it's impossible to, to use the correct words and any word itself is a social construct, but it's, uh, it's not something that's possible in my opinion, I suppose. But I, I, I believe that to be an ecclesiastical, uh, eternal truth. I actually see some aspects of religion manifest in pop culture fan communities, which model parts of the community and ritual aspects of religion without the belief structure. However, the highly collectivist nature of East Asia has likely slowed down the grassroots Very nature of new ideologies forming like they have in the West. 
A profound kind difference a between Confucianism and Western civilization comes from the West being guilt-based and that morality is controlled by one's personal sense of guilt before God. While in Confucian society, it's based upon following social expectations for the group. This has resulted in different core values right, surviving correct. the dereligioning process in East Asia than in the West. For example, with the exception of one-third Christian South Korea, the Western social justice movement has had trouble catching on in East Asia, given that veneration of ancestors and national group identity are seen as pivotal while denigrating ancestors and disrespecting authority is abhorrent. All of this adds up to making the modern Western left seem insane to East Asia, which is and will for the foreseeable future be on the different trajectory from the West. In the last few decades, the ideological vacuum has been somewhat filled with massive economic growth. The entirety of East Asia, with obvious exceptions like North Korea, has experienced tremendous economic growth since 1960. With yeah. the exception of Japan, these were all agricultural societies that were shoved into the industrial era in a single generation. In most of these societies, the lack of meaning is in many. So there's there there's a common thread here that, you know, Confucian societies and this was China, which is known as the Middle Kingdom in these different languages, um, sometimes called the Sinosphere, Sinosphere. These different nations here, I mean, Singapore itself is is uh, it has a large percentage of Han Chinese ethnicity. Um, they exist in Singapore. There's also Malays and some other people that live there, but the Han Chinese tend to control most of the actual power. Taiwan is, of course, officially known as the Republic of China. That's also ethnically Chinese. Hong Kong might as well be Chinese at this point. And then you have, and they are ethnically Chinese as well. And then South Korea is, um, South Korea is, they are a, um, a state that's based on uh, Confucianism as an ideology. They, they uh, based their culture around China. And at the time when the dynasty from Manchuria, the, which, which is foreign to the Han Chinese ethnicity, these were, this was the Qing dynasty that was overthrown just in the, in the 1910s, or well, really the late 1800s. Um, they were, I'm forgetting, Manchurians, Manchuria, Manchurians. They were Manchus. They weren't Han Chinese. Um, South Korea considered themselves the beacon of civilization while China was lost to the barbarians, which is what the, the Manchus were as they were a nomadic people. And then Japan to a lesser extent, but there is heavily, hevel, or there, excuse me, heavy influences of um, Confucianism and, and that ideology in Japan. And this can be seen with uh, Japanese reverence of, of mostly ancient uh, Chinese, um, poetry and, and some other things, but yeah, I digress. Just love talking about China. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to cool it. Gated and paid off by massive economic gains. When the pie grows, no one asks hard questions. However, we should look to Japan here as an example for where the whole region is going. Japan's economy was shockingly good until 1990, so much so that many worried that it would replace America as the main world's economy. However, their demographic America, structure was terrible without nearly enough young people to support their massive elderly population. This meant that their economy since 1990 has effectively ground to a halt as they have less young people to innovate and more old people to suck up economic growth. Also, mm. Japan was doing something a lot of Asian countries, such as China, are and that they're printing lots of money and pretending the system is richer than it really is in order to grow, which can't last forever. Basically, well, every sure, Confucian I mean, nation is screwed for this very reason. Most of East Asia has birth rates at half replacement level, meaning every generation halves. A top South Korean economist, when asked what he thought his nation's future would be, replied, bleak, since they were having so few kids that South Korea would face an immense crisis in the decades to come. Yeah, I think we're starting For to China, a nation with over more. a billion people, this process would be one of the most pivotal events in history. This period of strife and chaos will demand meaning as people can no longer rely on material success to justify living. Confucian civilizations generally had three countervening cultural forces balance each other out across its history. The first is utilitarian, which has been represented by legalism, a philosophy which basically holds that the end-all be-all of existence is to support the state, which was an immense failure until buttressed by the communitarian ethical force of Confucianism. These are Confucianism beliefs that need holds to be that by maintaining very ethical personal lives, we can uphold society in a good manner. The third force is mystic, like Taoism and Buddhism. Y'all already know that's my favorite, man. The Tao that can be named is not the eternal bow. Tao. Them, which involve a retreat into Always the mind that book and the right hidden spiritual parts of the world in order to find meaning. This is a topic I could spend days talking about, but in general, going forward, we'll see people pull on these various ideological roots in order to form future ideologies.
Yeah. China is now currently goes, trying to support a combination of legalist style obedience to the state with Confucianism. An interesting thing is that legalism as an ideology was detested for almost all of Chinese history, even though Chinese government still ran an effectively legalist grounds. But the Chinese Communist Party in recent years has been trying to revive legalism and has been having yeah. pro-legalist propaganda. Of course. Legalism with a different name it, is... Le legalism is the perfect uh, ideology for a autocrat. Yeah, the biggest comparison to anything in the West would, would probably be Hobbes, but it's like worse than that because... Excuse me. Uh, sorry. Because China is more authoritarian than, than Europe, just in, you know, in history. Really the ideology the Chinese government wants to promote. Legalism holds that obedience to the state is the highest good for an individual, which sounds like a goldmine for an authoritarian state like China, but also butts up against legalism continually failing so the population it rules hates it and it can't provoke the population's loyalty. In most societies across history, contrary to what Machiavelli said, it is better to be loved than feared. Since those who love you will fight to the death for you, while those who fear you will backstab you when you're weak. Legalism under Qi Shi Huang collapsed horrifically when the Stalin-esque dictator of 200 BC died and was no longer able to hold the empire together with his sheer force of personality. Similarly, the legalist-like philosophy of Imperial Japan during China is still named after him, so I don't in know. Complete insanity that declared war on four countries with more than twice its population at once and got beaten out of existence. In the crisis to come, if the CCP survives long enough, it'll try to promote a totalitarian ideology like those of the 20th century, in which the state has total power over the population. We see this already with the Chinese government putting cameras everywhere having the social credit system and promoting extreme nationalism. We already hear calls in China today to return to the more pure or Maoist days in propaganda. China is currently trying to shut its borders down and promote Han-only culture, as evidenced from the events with the Uyghurs. The logic would be yeah. that China is threatened from all sides and that only extreme loyalty to the government will allow the survival of society. We could really see this ideology without any connection to morality result in profoundly immoral results. We could, for example, see the production of baby factories and orphanages in order to try to boost the birth rate or 1984-style camera surveillance. Modern technology combined with totalitarianism is an absolutely horrifying combination. The yeah, so, that, so that's this thing, right? It's like... There's ideologies that exist on their own, and then there are ideologies that when they interact with each other, they produce something new because it's a new technology. And because there's a new technology, there's a new cultural understanding of how to deal with it. So uh, I use an example often is the example of slavery. Now, slavery existed for thousands and thousands of years, but uh, the transatlantic slave trade, which I, I don't subscribe to the opinion that the transatlantic slave trade is this evil above all evils, including above all other forms of slavery, because all different forms of slavery had, you know, any forms of being unfree. There are certain things that aren't even considered slavery that are um, that are really horrible things. But they. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The um, slavery is. But with transatlantic, I don't subscribe to the idea that it's the end all be all. I don't like how that that is something that I think happens is that particular type of slavery is made to be like, this is the worst thing ever. All the other slaveries, yeah, they exist, but they were different and they were okay because of this and this and this. And they're all socially constructed reasons of why it's okay and why it was better and why this one's the worst, which which has a political motive behind it. So they're they're horrible, but they're all horrible in their own way. Like, I don't know whether I'd rather be castrated in the Ottoman Empire or whether I would rather, you know, get my family ripped away from me. They both sound terrible. Actually, both of them result in your family being gone. But I digress. Um, the point is that the transatlantic slavery and the specific cruelties that came with it that weren't that didn't exist in other forms was the interaction of uh, this this old institution of slavery of war captives combined with this new idea of uh, early capitalistic ownership and, and these ships and the shared investments in these companies with this, with, and this is technology, the complexity that came with uh, creating companies that you would eventually see turn into things like the East India Company, the, the Belgian Congo Company that was cutting everybody's hands off. Um, it's, it's those interactions with those incentives. And there is something to be said there. Uh, so yes, continuing now. Let me know if you got any thoughts in the comments, please. And uh, please join the Discord if you're not in there.
The Communist Party has been trying to push for Confucianism in schools and education at the same time, but this has been a very whitewashed version of Confucianism, which only exists to really buttress Chinese nationalism in the state. The issue with Confucianism from the Chinese government's perspective is that it puts the central orbit of life on the local family level and literally says unethical and dishonorable rulers should be removed by revolution. Confucianism puts honor and duty above all else, which is yeah, terrifying crazy how much to this a moral state like Communist China that wants total power over society. The other Confucian nations around China have always existed in China's orbit and so have Glorious the remarkable ability to make rapid cultural transitions to basically keep up with what China's doing. And that's continued with rapid transitions towards capitalism, communism, Chinese or Western influence. In Korea, Vietnam, and Japan, as their crises continue, we're going to see profound family-based Confucian backlashes as their societies get broken by declining birth rates. People will blame their parents for following Western materialistic values too much, and they'll go hard in the other direction and demand a family-oriented society. This probably won't be good for women. The shame-based societies will quickly make the transition to strong nationalism and family-oriented values by making a massive co-opted decision. One of the interesting things about Eastern religions is that with the exception of Taoism or Shinto, they aren't disproved by modern science. Buddhism is basically all inside your head, and Confucianism is a theory of social behavior. So unlike the Abrahamic religions, there's nothing really science can disprove. However, even more interesting, Buddhism hasn't seen a resurgence in East Asia since World War II, although it has made inroads into the West. I wouldn't be surprised or consider it abnormal if Buddhism played its cards well here and grew massively. In general, East Asia of all the regions of the world is the most fertile ground for a. I don't know if I like this idea of growing massively. A lot of these things are not identities in the same way as Western religions, Abrahamic religions. Um, so totally new. It's like, what what are you growing into? Like, I guess it could be practiced more often religion. After Chinese legalism blows up, there's so much free turf here, and none of the ideologies here really connected people to a higher purpose in any meaningful way. They probably do. We just don't get it. They're very foreign to us, man. You can trace much of modern India down to a profound inferiority complex to the British. Lots of young people here might be like, oh my god, that was so long ago. But you have to remember, people are still alive Not today who ago. were there in British India. The fact that India was controlled for centuries by the British, outnumbered by the Indians more than 100 to 1, and ruling India without the Indians really resisting that hard is deeply humiliating. Meanwhile, the British in a lot of ways raped India, but at the same time clearly showed a higher technological and developmental level going in, which Nobody else the Indians have, have India, desperately India. tried to imitate and makes the Indians Nobody absolutely furious and insecure. Lots of Indians in the comments are going to say completely obscene things about me after this, but that's really just an insecure reaction. Don't you hate see me, India, it in guys. How India for perfectly copied the British parliamentary system, even though Britain and India are very different nations. Indian tech moguls buy out British companies like Range Rover, or the fanciest hotels in London. You see it in Indian nationalist historians warping history in bizarre ways, like saying the Indo Aryan invasions never took place 4,000 years ago, or that Churchill was a really Hitler level villain. The British created a unified India. Beforehand, India was a cultural and religious concept in the same way medieval Christianity was. However, centuries under first Muslim and then the British heel made India unified. This goes against millennia of Indian history, which divided people profoundly on caste lines into tiny different pieces of society. For example, the genetic difference between different castes in the same village is often three times greater than that between Norwegians and Italians. When you also add in ethnic, national, lingual, religious, and geographic differences to India, it's downright shocking India as a unified country in the first place. I'm always somewhat suspicious of Indian nationalism, given that it pushes against millennia of Indian history, which basically tells people to focus on their local caste and the spiritual life, rather than the broader nation, which has been the domain of the world. But that's the point, right? Like, you shouldn't be focusing on the state. You should be focusing on localism. It, 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 this is all this centralization towards a higher power. And by a higher power, I don't mean God. I don't mean a real higher power. I mean a higher power being a higher form of centralization, which just pushes us closer and closer to a one world government, even if it is to a state government rather than to a county or a local government. It, it's all more and more controlled over time. You know, there's ebbs and flows, but for a long time, it's been going straight up. And eventually, and this will come with technological advance, that does mean one government, whole world. Um, that's just momentum, just freaking momentum. Or your caste. Hinduism as a binding national force, which it kind of is in modern India, is very interesting. India is probably one of the most religious civilizations. Apparently, 
Indians deny this. And I don't know if that's just like them being like, no, you don't get it. But like, really, we basically do get it. And we're missing like a detail. But they're like, no, you're racist foreigners. Ah. It seems to be a thing. I don't know. Nations in history. And I'm not sure if greater wealth will make India less religious or not. Hinduism is in a lot of ways a perfectly designed religion in that different elements appeal to different parts of society. There are highly spiritual, intellectual, collective, personal, superstitious, and mythological aspects of Hinduism to pull from, and so Hinduism can effectively be tailored to any individual. I'm from the area around Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we have a sandwich shop called Wawa, where if you don't go there and only go there, visiting any of the competition, you're branded as a heretic and traitor to the Philly area. That's Islam. Meanwhile, Hinduism is a diner with a menu so long you can't even look at all the options and you wonder how the kitchen can include that many ingredients. If any of the major religions survive, I'm putting a decent bet on Hinduism, which is probably the most flexible religion in history. However, I don't think Hindu nationalism will survive. India has always been a fairly peaceful nation that's gotten along well with its neighbors. A couple of generations down the road, as India gets richer and the sting of British colonization gets further off, they'll calm down. As Burma, Bangladesh, and Pakistan get sucked into India's economic orbit in the same way Canada and Mexico are for the U.S., they'll sh I think, like, it's just, I don't know, maybe, but, like, I don't have the same confidence that he does. It's like, I think we should be more cautious about applying Western ideas about how the world works to areas of the world that are not western in the same way although india is more related to us than china shift from a religious base to a civilizational one indian civilization in all its complexity will be championed with attempts to make islam and pakistan and bangladesh more indian islam and hinduism coexisted inside india for centuries albeit after the muslims killed and raped tens of millions india of india wasn't a thing in See, i don't like that he's saying this this needs to be very clear because like india <laughs> as a concept is like the entire giant region there was never one empire that kind of took control of it. There were the Tamils in the south. There was there was like the Mughal, which were Mongols. It was just a word that was based in in Mongol. And there were a bunch of different kingdoms in different areas. The Pashtuns, um, the freaking Sikh empire, like there were a bunch of different ones. But there was never, ever until the British, anybody that uh, united all of this area that we today call India. It just was never true, even just what's India today, because the Indian Empire covered also Pakistan and Bangladesh, which is not only a huge land area, but it's also like 500 million people or so, I think. Power, but it can be done. After all, Hinduism believes all religions are different ladders in the road to God. Once India feels secure, it'll move to a civilizational basis of being a part of Indian civilization rather than a religious one, which will allow it to coexist with its neighbors. Islam has been going through profound issues lately. For highly complex reasons dating back to the Middle Ages, Christianity became widely successful, colonizing most of the world while political Islam was continually defeated. This was really soul-crushing for Islam, which believes itself to be the better, newer version of Christianity. This was they had their golden age. first dealt with by ignoring the West and saying it was unimportant, which was the case for the 19th century, then trying to imitate Western culture while generally ignoring Islam, which was most of the 20th century, and then radical Islam showed up. However, radical Islam has also failed at achieving the goals inherent in Islamic civilization of building a universal caliphate that surpasses Christianity. That's been the goal of basically every Islamic state since the dawn of time. You know, time preference-wise you would say that Islam's losing today. But at the same time, like, look at Lebanon. Lebanon used to be essentially a Christian state with a small Muslim minority. It's now a majority Muslim. And I, you know, I've spoken to Lebanese Christians that live in the United States now, and thank God, I'm happy to have them here. I think they're, they're fantastic people. But, you know, they're, they're often upset about how their country was essentially taken over in a few generations by uh, the demographic increase of the... Um, of of the muslims in relation to their own population oh hey prudentialist i didn't realize you're still here man thanks a lot for coming i hope you're enjoying it um huntington's thesis says gospel about the critiques of fukuyama without the critiques fukuyama gave to civilizational theory yeah okay and and that's probably why i don't like him because i i tend to heavily heavily and i've talked about this before um my view of uh political order political establishment is is very heavily influenced um, I don't want to say solely influenced, but but most heavily influenced by Fukuyama's uh, two volume set, uh, Political Order and Political Decay, I think is what it's called. 
but yeah, it's it's flawed, but it's it's an argument. Um, I just sometimes it seems like what if Alt Hiss says things, and I get it for the sake of argument, but he says things, he says them as facts when they are too much of an argument to be said with that level of clarity. But that that's the way he does it. It's you know, it's fine. I like the guy. And then Craig says, Christian nations have a very low birth rate. Muslims have a very high birth rate. Exactly. And over time, those demographics can really shrink. Um, actually, was it Prudentialist? Was it you? I was listening to a stream the other day. It might have just been Bog Beef's stream, his his regular one with Marbleck on uh, Good Old Boys. But they were talking about um, the issue of the difference in birth rate between even Israeli uh Jewish people as a whole, like there's some Orthodox that create that, that have more offspring, but the majority, um, do not. And that brings the average down compared to the Palestinians. And one of the things that was brought up was that all they really have to do is scare people into not moving there and not living there. And then because pretty much all of those people can live in Western Europe or the U S or Canada. Um, but yeah, let's get back to the, what if all hissed here. I'm. We've gotten to the point where most Muslims are disgusted by ISIS, Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, and Iran. However, most Muslims in America, that's in America. It's not really true in other countries. It's it's been shown by polls. It's it's just not true. Muslims are still pious and believe in the religion. Thus, we've seen the transition of countries like Turkey or Saudi Arabia, in which they try to have science for the foreign policy and public policy and Islam for the culture. This is since the religion maintains internal social cohesion while the cruel logic of the outside world allows the nation to not be conquered and compete effectively in the global stage. This combination of religion for the cultural sphere and science for the external is really good, and it's what the West had from around 1300 to World War I. I'm one of the very few Westerners who actually sees immense potential for Islam in the decades to come. Islam has stable demographics and it believes in itself, having a coherent ideology of expansion and unity. Similarly, we've gradually seen a move towards the world of the 16th century, in which all the main Eurasian civilizations are wealthy and powerful. India and China have already industrialized, and so why wouldn't Islam, the fourth of the main Eurasian civilizations, also do so? Turkey is already industrialized, and Iran's halfway there, and I could see the other countries in the region modeling their own industrial revolutions after those two afterwards, in the same way the East Asian tigers model themselves in Japan. I think there's a very different thing when you're industrializing today versus industrializing 70 years ago. Um, so, like, let's be clear there that industrialization at a time when industrialization doesn't mean you're catching up with the rest of the world when the rest of the world has passed past industrialization. Um, you know, it depends on how you think about economic theory, I suppose, because it's possible. And a lot of people have the opinion and I do as well, that the creation of actual, you know, physical goods and, uh, in, in the country, like that is very important and it will be more important in the long term because the assets are what's important and a lot of our stuff is fake but really i think the only time that that becomes insanely relevant is in the destruction of the global economy to a complete extent it's possible that we will move into a multipolar world without a sort of crisis that would destroy the um the uh the intel uh, essentially economy of the west of the us and canada and, and western europe but uh, yet to be seen. But yeah, Israel's demography has an issue with its more ultra orthodox population having a higher TFR. Um, I'm assuming that's birth rate. I don't I'm not familiar than the other groups, which has been a part of its political crisis pre Hamas violence. Yes, and that and that group even controls a they control an outsized percentage of the uh, of influence. They have an outsized amount of influence in in the parliament there even based on their their smaller population um and even without the gains that they will get in population into the future um essentially it, it's really rough in israel i think because people came from all over the world and they had influences from all these different countries all these different systems that are so different from them and even different ethnicities with the sephardis so there's a lot of different things that uh break israelis apart even within jewish israelis and um, the thing is, though, when something like this happens, when some an attack like this happens, and I'm not I'm not passing judgment, you know, both people, you know, have arguments for being attacked. But regardless of, of what your people have done to somebody else, somebody does that to your people. I mean, it's different. You're just you're biased, but you're going to be biased because of the stakes and uh, all those other differences tend to go away in the face of that. So, yeah, I digress. Let's keep going. Cleveland. Japan, 
and Western industrialization upon Britain and Germany. There are a couple of things to note about Islam and the sort of situation that develop here. The first of which is that Islam is always aimed towards unified theocracies. So Jesus said, love thy neighbor and don't be a dick, and then got crucified before he could get any further. Christians had to make up the rest to figure out how to manage their societies. Muhammad, meanwhile, founded an empire and laid out very clear instructions on every part of human behavior, including stuff like trade and government. Islam is a political and cultural force while Christianity is mostly just cultural. This means that every regime in Islamic civilization for the 20th century was partially a theocracy, pulling on the religious framework in Islam to support their right to rule. Since Islam is also political, it can transcend ethnic barriers. The political goal of Islam is to unify the House of Islam into a caliphate. Loyalty in the Islamic world is V-shaped, with either very strong transnational loyalty to international Islam or to local tribal forces. Modern technology and the common struggle against Western colonialism, American invasion, and Israel has given the Islamic world a strong sense of unity. Young Syrians or Yemenis on Twitter identify as Arabs and Sunnis. I think these combined forces, along with the U.S. getting oil independence and thus caring less about the region, will result in the formation of a pan-Sunni caliphate in the Middle East, based probably around Turkey. One of the great strengths of Islam is its immense diversity. I like to tell my friends that if I was born in Algeria rather than America and studied Quran rather than history, I could be declaring fatwas or personal jihads in my YouTube channel. Islam doesn't have popes or national churches, and so charismatic preachers and people who can adapt to the modern world do very well in Islam, which has given Islam tremendous power. In summary, I think a reformed Islam which respects science but is also yeah, so it's a it's a simple matter of incentives, right? Like I have a lot to say here, but just for brevity, I I won't. Um, I mean, what you see here is it, I, I wish that there were multiple maps. That's maybe a good idea for me to do in the future is look at multiple maps one after the other. I mean, different styles of maps that cover the same area, political, geography, ethnic maps. Um, because what you see here, you you see this is Iran, right? This is Iran, and it's in all red. That's Shia. And this is because Shia Islam, this particular type of Islam, um, and there are, there's more than just a body. There's some other differences like Sufi, although I think Sufi is sometimes, it's usually, it's, it doesn't matter. Um, they're Shia. So Shia Islam, like, yes, there's these ecclesiastical differences, but these ecclesiastical differences that you have between Shia and Sunni, it's a, it's a matter of um, who should succeed uh, Muhammad. I don't remember the exact argument. I don't want to disrespect uh, any of the Muslim listeners, but it's a, is it, the thing is like, think about the cultural differences and how Iran was its own powerful empire, its own powerful culture, because, you know, when, when a culture, when, when a new religion moves into some place, different places, it'll be practiced differently by the different people there. They'll, they'll add in their own folk traditions. This happens not only in Christianity, but in any other religion. Um, even in pagan religions, but the the Shia Islam that that comes out of Iran, I mean, it's it's it does have some heavily heavy influences from Zoroastrianism. This uh, this root of um, this this old ancient religion of the Persians, which are the the main ethnic group in Iran, and um, I think that's Azerbaijan as well, which is heavily related to the Iranians and a few other pockets, but. It, it it makes sense that not only would these people choose to believe something different than these other people as as these people in turkey these are um these are mostly these are turkic people i mean really a lot of them are turkicized um hellenic greeks but regardless these are arabs over here turkics they were a step tribe of people they tend to adopt other religions so they did adopt sunni islam um that just happens to be what happens but this over here, all of this Islam, this was mostly Arabs. Down here is different, of course, um, but this is Arabs. It's all, you know, they have their their differences, but they're united under being Arabs. Um, you know, I don't know what's going on over here. Again, these were mostly Turkic people. But once again, I have, I have digressed. Uh, any questions, comments, please put them in there. I uh, love interacting with you guys. Thanks a lot. Appreciate everybody being here at so late at night. Craig, you still at the lake, man? What are you, what are you doing out here, uh, Cleveland? Also, Pius has immense potential on the world stage. Europe's had a profound crisis of identity since the world wars. 
all the pillars that's the true. West used to justify its own superiority, for better or for worse, just Christianity, white supremacy, Western civilization, and capitalism have been torn down to a certain degree. Yeah. Europe's highly individualistic nature has resulted in a plethora of pseudo-religions filling the void coming out of the decline of Christianity. Some of them take up the ritual and communal aspects like fan communities, romantic or wellness culture. Others take a philosophic route like communism, social justice, or Nazism, and others like neoliberalism have tried to make as much money as possible to fill the moral void. Going forward, we're going to split Western civilization between America and Europe, which are ideologically very different spots. In Europe, the world wars were deeply crippling. Nazism was so evil and horrifying that much of Europe afterwards basically decided to go for the exact opposite. While the Nazis were nationalistic, hyper-masculine, racist, and militaristic, modern Europe is transnational, generally dislikes aggression, is multicultural and pacifist. However, when you push anything to an extreme, absurdity ensues. You need to have more than one dot in your moral framework. By trying too hard to not be Nazis, at the expense of alienating nearly half my fan base, I'm going to say Europe's become pathetic. It's shrunk from 38 to 24 percent of the world's economy since 1965, while the U.S. has remained a stable quarter. It continually sheds its inventor and creative class to America, since its bureaucratic state constricts anyone who wants to do anything. The European Union is incapable of dealing with crises. Big Brother America stepped in and bailed out Europe in the 2008 financial crash, Yugoslavia, Libya, and guess who's currently managing Europe's foreign policy against Russian aggression? America. Western Europe free rides off American defense while imbibing American culture while enviously hating America. Europe's main ideology has been comfort. Comfort for their own populations with nice welfare systems, comfort from the dangers of international politics the Americans can handle, and comfort from having to ask difficult questions about what Europe means anymore. Similarly, Europe's collapsing birth rates putting it into a similar issues as the confusion East Asian nations. Europe's dealt with declining birth rates by importing immigrants, but hasn't really done a very good job of integrating said immigrant. Yeah, for real, bro. It, that's an understatement. Okay, whatever. We're just going to go past that. In America or Canada, for example, practically everyone's of immigrant ancestry, and societies are great at assimilating immigrants. This isn't the case in Europe, where, for example, Muslims are often radicalized since they don't feel at home in the European societies. As Europe ages, it'll also get poorer. America is also getting less and less willing to support Europe as it has more issues at home. Europe will have a profound crisis of identity in the years to come. Europe will have to make very difficult choices about what it stands for. There's so much random chaos here. Christianity, which was the main glue holding Europe together, has little sway. Most Europeans today follow a secularized version of Christian values while generally being atheist. The European religious are actually less religious on average in terms of praying, believing in God, going to church, etc. than the American non-religious, for reasons I'll explain in the next segment. Europe will either break under the pressure or develop a totally new ideology. I hope the Europeans don't turn to extreme Hungary, number one. And racism, which seems to be the Uncle logical Victor, extension bro. of their right. The American and European right are interesting. The American right, with even under the libertarian wing, being pretty Christian. But when I talk to European right-wingers, I struggle to see what they believe in besides sort of knee-jerk Western civilization. That when you boil it down means, I don't want more brown people and left-wing ideology, which is not a coherent motivational ideology to go forward with. However, unless Europe tries something totally new, it you know, I probably would have agreed with you a few years ago, but I don't know. Seems a little bit more coherent now. And I'm not saying from like a racist perspective necessarily, but, you know, when there's when there's a cultural difference, yeah, you know, it's not because they're brown, but it's because of like when he says brown, I'm thinking of particular immigrants from from other places. You know what? I don't want to do this. I don't want to get canceled. I'm on YouTube. Um, like that is associated with other differences that do matter. Like, the, you know, the color of your skin doesn't matter as long as the other things like uh, as long as you match with the other things. Like it's you know, it's not like somebody from Scotland, like a pale Scottish guy is has the same skin tone as a Greek person. But there's a difference between like, yes, they are different flavors of Christianity. One might be a Catholic or a Protestant, whereas one might um whereas orthodox is pretty different but at least they're still christian and it in their western orthodox is that i think even eastern orthodox the russian orthodox they they were they're able to to uh assimilate pretty well into the u.s but it, it's much harder when you when you go past that um you know some of the founding fathers did talk about you know this being a christian nation and that it you know you needed you you needed that um I was listening. To, oh, man, I was listening to the Prudentialist earlier today, and he, he's in here with uh, Oren McIntyre. And you guys were talking about something related to this, I think, about the. Um, uh, 
is about it being right for the character of the nation. It might have been, gosh, I just spend all my time going on different streams and everything, watching them, whether I'm a part of them or not. But I, I digress. There's there's stuff there. Um, I've talked about it before. Um, it's in the episodes. It will break and shatter under the pressure like the ancient Greeks or Romans did before. The European left and right don't have expansive views of the world, more just get rid of people I don't like. Europe isn't a highly cohesive collectivist society like China or Korea that will force itself to pull itself together under pressure. Europe's individualist and atomized, and so if it loses its way, it'll die. Russia's in a very similar position to the rest of Europe here, with declining birth rates and lack of any real expansive ideology. I also think Russia would either break again under the pressure or be able to reform. Russia's pulled several Hail Marys across its history, whether yeah, with Ivan the Terrible, rates, Stalin, geez. or Peter the Great. The Russians still have a certain grit and stoicism missing from the rest of Europe. However, it was also beaten down in the 20th century more than the rest of Europe. I put the chances that Russia gets its act together around a quarter. America completely ideologically diverged from Europe in the era after the World Wars. The World Wars weren't very horrifying for America, and so the U.S. remained aggressive, religious, and capitalist while Europe did not. A huge divergence between the U.S. and Europe is that the U.S. is far more religious than Europe, largely because in Europe the religions were all state-based, and so for centuries people just went to the churches that their rulers told them to. Due to a combination of the world wars and conscious suicide in the part of the European churches, religiosity collapsed after the world wars. America, meanwhile, established itself as a secular nation, which doesn't mean what most people think it does, but does mean that the U.S. doesn't have an official church. America's religion, like everything else in its society, is based off capitalist principles. Like Islam, American Protestantism is extremely dynamic, spouting off countless different sects since people continually change churches to the one that suits them best. Your average American changes their sect of Christianity at least once in their lives. Uninspiring churches die out and are replaced by interesting ones. Something a lot of people don't know is that American Protestantism is global. About a quarter of Latin America are Protestants converted to originally American sects. Majorities of many African countries like Zimbabwe and South Africa worship sects of Protestantism brought to them by American preachers. A lot of this comes in the form of Pentecostalism yeah, or charismatic Christianity, which came out of 1920s Los Angeles and which... That, that's funny because it's completely outside the context of its time. One of these things, by the way, I should mention and um, why religion props up in a lot of these places is, you know, it is associated with connection... Um, to uh to status and it might be connected to very tangible things like like higher paying jobs um and and that is true i mean you know i have a friend who my, my best friend actually higgy who you know i know craig knows higgy some of you some of the other listeners might know him as well but he is a um he grew up in kind of what he describes as a religious cult it's one of those more extreme protestant evangelical sects and you know that they have a bunch of churches all over the world and they've they brought some people from bolivia one of his cousins married a bolivian woman from like their sister church and a lot of these people they now have connections in the u.s and they're over here um and you know i don't necessarily have i don't see anything wrong with that um but but it is a thing and it's it is a it shows the the very real um the very real worldly incentives that maybe joining a different religion has um and, and this is why when a certain religion starts like conquering another one, you know, it's often you don't have to force people to convert if they choose to convert. And then they're more likely to stay converted. Uh, and this is kind of how Islam spread. Well, some of it was warfare, but a lot of it was just with the trade benefits of it entirely. But uh, yeah, let's keep going worship becomes deeply intense as people speak in tongues and gibberish as they connect with God. This has allowed a certain merging with local mystic traditions. There are nearly 300 million Pentecostalists around the world and 500 million people who worship similar sects. American Protestantism is making such massive gains in the third world that if trajectories continue, Protestantism will be a majority of all Christianity by 2050. One of the interesting things in America is that even though organized religion has declined, religiosity has to a much lesser extent. The growing agnostic community in a lot of ways isn't. Your average American agnostic, when polled, believes in God, prays on an occasional basis, and is looking for a deeper spiritual connection. It's just that the current churches and religions aren't providing a framework that's appealing or meaningful to them. You've seen cycles of traditional versus intuitive religion in American history. For example, church attendance was far higher in the 1950s than any other era in American history, even the American Revolution, in which only 15 to 40 percent of Americans attended church on a regular basis. We're currently in an era of intuitive religion in which people mix their own combinations of politics, whatever religions they want, with New Age beliefs to form individual... Add, check out one of my episodes. 
why wokeism is a religion. Um, I go over the ep the definition. Actually, I think I went over the Durkheim, the Emil Durkheim definition for that one. <coughs> Excuse me. I have to go back and look, but um, I think I did. But I did that. By personal belief structures. Meanwhile, you see lots of surrogates for religion appearing in modern America. Fan and wellness culture, for example, often fill the ritual and community parts. Similarly, political movements often fill the ideological void. Interestingly enough, the 40s decades have continually seen religious revivals in America. The 1740s were the first Great Awakening, the 1840s were the second Great Awakening, and the 1940s were the post-World War II religious boom. I don't know why this happens, it could be generational, but let's just say I wouldn't be surprised if a religious revival takes place in the 2040s in America. I don't know what the next evolution of American religion will be. I feel like a profound shift will have to take place to adapt to the digital age and people's changing understandings of the world. I wonder if some sects of Protestantism will take on New Age aspects and become more deist or mystic. Similarly, preaching will probably start to take place online as well. This is already starting to happen. One of my friends actually founded the first purely digital mainline Protestant church in America. The only thing I know is that American society is remarkably creative and there's a massive void for spiritual belief and community in modern American society. The big question is just how much the next religious wave deviates from the current religious norms. The right and left-wing divide in America, when it boils down to it, is really a religious conflict. Both the right and left believe in liberalism, but liberalism is barely an ideology at this point and largely relies upon other ideologies to support it, since wanting freedom and democracy doesn't cover any of the moral frameworks like community and ethics that a religion would. The right pulls from Christianity and the left from belief in equality and lack of harm that stems from a combination of Marxism and Christianity. You can actually see this as a manifestation of an ideological struggle inherent of all of Western civilization between traditional Christianity and Augustinian interpretations. Traditional Christianity holds that humanity is naturally good and is corrupted by greed, and if we all loved each other, we'd be in the kingdom of heaven, which is basically what the left believes in secular terminology. Marx turned this to an oppressive class holding down the virtuous working classes, which gradually warped into cishet white males and colonizers holding back the inherently virtuous oppressed groups. Meanwhile, the right believes in the Augustinian approach that comes indirectly from Persian religions like Zoroastrianism and Manichaeism that world's a struggle in the forces of good I was led by That's God fine. and evil Seems like a reach what I said, The forces of good must wage war against the forces of evil that want to tear down civilization, represented in their right by Muslims, atheists, communists, etc. This underlying struggle is inherent to Western civilization, but Wait, I generally... Did he, I'm going to back that up. Did he say Muslims want to destroy civilization? I don't... They want to... The force... Maybe ours, but it's not theirs, but they're definitely very civilization oriented that's not fair of evil that want to tear down civilization represented in their right by muslims atheists communists etc this underlying struggle is mm -hmm. inherent to western civilization but i generally think okay. that in this round the furthest left will end up self-destructing this is because in its drive for purity the social justice wing without having any countervailing forces will end up taking more and more radical positions until it alienates everyone else. Social justice's literal lack of belief in truth and compromise means that it easily unmoors itself from reality or any ability to- Okay, okay. Um, look, I get it. Reality is reality. Like, um, but at the same time, like, I, I don't, I don't, um, look, the, the word reality is a social construct. People interact with the world in different ways. And, you know, I, I like I get it. The sky is blue, but like the rule is proven or disproven by the things at the extremes. And it's just I take this extreme approach of cultural relativism. If you've listened, you know, that's that's like the main thing that I do is this extreme approach of cultural relativism. And it's not even just cultural relativism. It's also innate, you know, physical things. Um, excuse me, DNA, nature. Like th there are differences there. If you can see differences in human beings and height, skin color, nose shape, eye shape, things like that, which you can, it's then there's differences in the way people perceive their world, the world. And over time they would become very different, but um, you know, now they're relatively minor compared to some of the other differences, um, you know, between different other species and, and between mammals. Um, yeah judge situations accurately and think strategically. Similarly, the Social Justice Coalition is fairly weak in how disparate its coalition is. Married couples, for example, tend to vote decently similarly, which negates them when they try to split women off as a demographic to push against the patriarchy. Similarly, 
Probable majorities of ethnic minorities, especially Hispanics and Asians, would prefer to assimilate and get status in traditional American society rather than tear down the patriarchy, white supremacy, etc. As immigrant groups assimilate more, they tend to identify more with American society, which is a big reason why Donald Trump was the Republican who won the highest percentage of ethnic minority votes since practically the 19th century. For social justice to hold together a coalition of Asians, Hispanic, and Black people who in many circumstances have more in common with white people than each other, it can get quite unwieldy. One of the things that confused me with the modern left strategy was alienating young men through the emphasis on toxic masculinity and the inherent patriarchy. In practically every society in history, for contestable reasons, men are a majority of the leadership in most social positions. And so by alienating young men, they're effectively killing their own cause 20 years down the road. So, you know, that's that's true in a lot of ways. And it's true effectively for this. Um, but it should be noted that, like, this is applying values to how leadership functions. It's applying like a socially constructed idea. So I would just be careful because, you know, there's lots of ways that women use soft power. And there's a lot of examples in history from this um, about this, like examples like Elizabeth I, uh, Cleopatra, um, Ching Shi, who's one of my favorite lesser known, but she's the most powerful pirate ever. Um, like uh, men, women, anything. Um, and, and there are some really effective women that do this. And, and sometimes I think that like, there's probably a lot of stuff in history that just wasn't written down. Just like a lot of, um, and like, this isn't like the woke approach, but you know, because sometimes I think they go too far in the other direction and in a wrong direction. Um, but th there's, there's a divergence of values and there's a divergence of cap capabilities between any, any number of different ways that um, you, you can break up different human beings, but at the same time, there is, uh, gosh, there's differences between any, any type of way that you could break up human beings, but there's also like, there's differences in abilities and there's differences of values. I, I got, I got distracted. Sorry. Mouth breathers young, the biggest, is that me? It's <laughs> road by breeding a leadership class that hates them. I'm generally seeing two different ideological trajectories emerge among young men today. The first is a sort of centrism with Jordan Peterson as its prophet. Depressingly, for lots of young men, Jordan Peterson is the only force in their lives that tell them that their lives have meaning. Stoicism is also a secondary force in this field. For these reasons, it wouldn't surprise me if 30 years down the road, Jordan Peterson's ago. philosophy a weird becomes right very important to society. The centrist area is also generally like pretty liberal in a traditional sense, but is also masculine and really doesn't appeal to women much. The other main force is the so-called alt-right, which isn't really a single movement, but a lot of weird ideological pieces thrown into a veritable fruit. So what I was kind of thinking of, you know, the alt the term alt-right is kind of gone by the wayside, but like, uh, Salad. I'm going to move a broad spectrum this, so extending to Jordan me. Peterson's centrist with very few people the actual extreme, but lots somewhere in the path to it. Sadly, I've seen an incredible amount of radicalization in the last couple of years, largely because people being pissed off at the left as people move further right. And so, um... Oh man, now I forgot what I was going to say. It's late, brothers. Um, yeah, so I guess like I'm a right wing content creator and I'm not mainstream. I'm not Ben Shapiro or Tucker Carlson. I guess that makes me all right. I mean, I'm not these guys, definitely not these guys, but I guess technically I'm all right. You're the all correct. Hell yeah, brother. Oh, this could change. One of the general truths I've found out the alt-right is that it's on average far more sexist than racist, although it often is both. A big question for America is, after social justice and <laughs> will thing. the far right or the center gain power afterwards? Something that worries me about both of these groups... Shout out Top Lobster, Tower Gang. ...groups is that they're both very heavily male, and even among the centrists, you do find a certain degree of misogyny beneath the surface. Nice. Also, adding together the Always need nerds who make these ideologies often didn't get laid a lot as youths adds to my worry of a heavily misogynist, or at least bro -y philosophy developing. Wait, it also seems worried probable about America misogyny? will have a national need a little misogyny. Clash. Across American history, too. we've seen immigration patterns in which once the foreign-born population reaches 20%, the U.S. cuts off immigration for the next 60 years to assimilate the newcomers. This occurred I, in both 1790 and 1920. And I think it'd be like okay if we stopped right now. Dude. After each of these periods, America experienced a period. That was a weird cut. This was from two years ago when the um, the numbers of immigrants coming in had the the deporter in chief, Obama, no matter how you feel about that, he deported a lot of people. Um, immigration went down. It stayed, it, it got up a little bit, stayed down under Trump. Uh, it went down under Obama. 
in his eight years stayed down under Trump, and it has exploded. Uh, and for a long time, I was saying, you know, at least we don't have what's going on in Europe. That's crazy. It's causing all this social unrest. Um, but now it looks like we might have it. Or maybe, maybe they just gave us a little taste and then it switched. We'll see what happens. But uh, I hope that that shut off because that's going to, it's going to cause a lot of problems. It's, and it's not like I, you know, I, I hate these people that, that, you know, want to come here. It's just that you can't accept that many people and that many different people and then have it be the same thing. It doesn't help them. It doesn't help us. It doesn't help anybody. And then these, these pathways are, are, you know, the, the immigration, um, paths that people take, they're, they're full of, uh, people being exploited for money, exploited for labor, exploited for, you know, worse and worse things. Um, all the worst things, including in children, not just grown women. But I digress the last bit of this video. Period of strong American nationalism and unified American identity gets exalted. This will likely happen again as America goes through a period of extreme nationalism. Also, across American history, we've seen the idea oh, of white America. We're so back. We're so fucking back. American expand from just basically white Britons and Dutch to now involving Jews, Lebanese, Italians, etc., it seems likely that many Hispanics who are on average two thirds European Race ancestry awesome. and marry into the white population at That's high true. levels, alongside Asians who also marry white people at really high rates, start to be classified as white. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternative. Um, oh, oops. I just want to say congratulations to the Asians for being accepted as whites. Um, Cleveland, that's the end of that video. I think I'm going to do another one because um, there's people here. Uh, I don't know who else is still hanging out besides uh, Iria. Um, I, I know I see you here all the time, but I do not know what to call you, man. Um, but I'm going to grab another video here. Mix it up. You want me to mix it up? What do you want? What do you want me to put on? You got any sort of thing? I'll just go down here and I'll pick something. Somebody that I know before, though. I could do. Uh, I've been wanting to do this for a while, but you know, another wall. What I call hist, Star Wars theory. Understanding Western civilization in 29 minutes. Man, Masa, man. I don't know where that guy went, but I really liked it. I got to pick something else so you guys don't leave. That's all right. I should have just grabbed something. Let's see. I got to understand that. Whatever. I'm learning. Let's do understanding. Western, Western civilization has had a pretty good time. It's kickstarted the greatest technological revolution ever and conquered the vast majority of the world. Cleveland. The West was so Cleveland beginning of uh, understanding Western civilization. So successful that everyone in the world tried to imitate. What, what do you mean? Say your name. Your name is is Aria. How am I like? What is that? Laria. What is this? Why and how did this happen? What even is Western civilization? It's defining features. This video is part of a series I plan on making looking at the structures and macro histories of each of the main world civilizations. I'm starting here with Western civilization, but I hope to go into Islamic, Confucian, Mesoamerican, or classical civilization, seeing how they rose and fell and their strengths and weaknesses. With that out of the way, let's start. A pivotal part of Western civilization's history were the Normans, who conquered England, Sicily, and parts of the Levant. There were some absolutely incredible figures in Norman history between William the Conqueror, Robert Guiscard, and Tancred d'Hauteville. I was in fact just watching a pretty interesting documentary of the Normans. 
I love the Middle Ages and it's my favorite year of history, and so it's always fun to watch more stuff about it. I was able to watch this on Magellan TV, a documentary streaming service made by filmmakers that has the richest history content of any streaming service. What can I call you? It's got great content ranging from the Middle Ages to the ancient modern world. Alongside cool biography, geopolitics, and practically any other material. Magellan's compatible with basically any device and has 4K with no additional cost. Magellan's also having a special offer of a one-month free subscription for what a felt test fan to part of Western. I'm going to start here with a controversial claim. The Greeks and Romans weren't a part of Western civilization. I understand this is somewhat arguable and the definitions are pretty blurred. As an American of British descent who speaks a Germanic language, uses a Germanic law code, wears tartan on a regular basis, and worships an interpretation of Christianity invented in 17th century Britain, I know I'm coming at this from a very different perspective of a Frenchman or Italian whose religion, language, and legal code are all derivations of the Roman. However, my historical speciality is the era around the fall of Rome, and I can tell you that a massive palpable shift took place in the two or so centuries on either side of 400 AD. Let me explain what these changes were, and in doing so, I'll demonstrate really how different the Romans were from the modern West. Also, if we're being perfectly fair here, I'm splitting classical civilization off so I can make a future video about it. This also brings up the question over whether Latin America and Orthodox Eastern Europe, like Russia, are parts of Western civilization. I'm not going to answer that question here, but I do think those civilizations are distinct enough that they- I think... I'm gonna have to hear it. They weren't their own videos explaining them. The West, as I'm describing it here, is the part of Europe that was part of medieval Catholicism, alongside the English and French-speaking parts of North America. I don't like that it's cut out at, basically, the Ottoman Empire. God, Anglo Oceania. I'll also throw in parts of South Africa if it suits me. Western civilizations got three big influencing parts Germanic, Roman, and Christian. Some parts have Slavic and Celtic, and in America's case, African influence, but every part of Western civilization has some varying degree of Germanic, Roman, or Christian influence. Looking at how these three forces combined to form the modern West is a fascinating story. The story starts with the fall of Rome. Much to most people's surprise, by the time we get to the end of the empire, the western segment had basically degenerated into a parasitic clusterfuck that was actively hurting the inhabitants involved. Based. The western empire was an authoritarian aristocratic command economy with some of the worst inequality of any era in history. The Roman Empire in the year 380 was the closest thing you'll get to the imperium of mankind in Warhammer 40k. The sources of political power and economy were also completely non-functioning, with the empire incapable of raising armies of its own 30 million people and instead hiring barbarians. These barbarians ended up taking over political power once they realized how rotten the internal organization really was. When the empire fell, the health and quality of life for the average peasant in Western Europe actually improved. Once the central government stopped working, three sources of social power filled the vacuum and gradually formed a single elite that became Western civilization. The influence of the Germanic barbarians varied a lot depending on region. In some areas like England or the Rhineland, they depopulated much of the native population and became the majority culture. However, in most of Western Europe, there weren't enough of the barbarians to really have a huge effect. For a comparison, something like 200,000 Anglo-Saxons probably migrated to England, a country whose population was knocked back to somewhere over half a million due to plague, while only 3,000 Visigoths went to Spain, a region with a population of 5 million. It's no surprise that England became a practical extension of Scandinavia, losing Christianity and the Latin alphabet while Spain remained practically Latin. What occurred in the more heavily populated parts of Western Europe like Spain, France, and Italy was that the barbarians quickly intermarried with the pre-existing ruling elite. Taxes were so bad in the late Roman Empire that wealthy Romans actively immigrated to the countryside and became lords on massive estates where the tax collectors couldn't get them. So much better. In this part of the Roman Empire, before the empire fell, there hadn't been a major non-civil war war for four 400 years, meaning the Roman elite were heavily pacified. The Germanic barbarians became a warrior elite while the native elite often went into the church. Under most circumstances, these elites generally became the same thing over time. Okay, so that's that's interesting because I, I hadn't heard of this like difference of the church. I, I You know, granted, I don't know enough about that aspect of it, I think, but that's it's interesting that the different elites would then be organized in those distinctly like that but then how would they merge over time i suppose in her marriage and the different patterns sometimes it would be like a uh it'd be like somebody 
leaving the um geez guys i'm too tired to be doing this i i've been doing this all day um leaving the uh oh they're like leaving it to the to the second third sons because the first son gets everything and they would be moved into but regardless the dominant power of these ex-Roman kingdoms was the Frankish Empire, or the only one that actively pursued a policy of working with the Catholic Church and the native aristocracy. This is also considering that the Frankish Empire at its inception was the weakest of the major barbarian kingdoms. The Church was the sole functioning international literate organization in the West. It was also the only fully meritocratic organization, so the smartest people went into the Church. This meant that money and talent flooded into the church, making it the most important cultural organization in Western Europe and the glue holding the broader society together. The shifts that created modern Western civilization occurred in this era. Starting with the Germanic barbarians, the West got a warlike ruling class. In most of the world civilizations like the Arab world, Hindus, and China, the ruling class were respectively merchants, priests, and bureaucrats. This actually did the West a remarkable amount of good. What occurred in those other Asian civilizations was that since the native... I mean, this is based on their culture, right? So in Byzantium, this is based on the Roman Empire, essentially most of their culture. Based in the central government, it's this old system from before, even though they have the religion, it's powerful. In Islam, merchants and landowners, but the Islamic religion is based in the, the Bedouin tribe culture of, um, uh, they would go different freaking bedouin tribes nomads they were nomadic traders and uh so it makes sense merchants i mean the founder of the religion was a, was a merchant muhammad uh indic priests yep vedic down from there scenic bureaucrats yes it's confucianism it's legalism it's based on um your ability to pass these tests and that uh, in effect like it shapes your civilization it's, it's what the incentives that that produce what skills in your country and you know if your culture produces the wrong skills it might mean that you go extinct and your people either adopt another culture's ideas or they're wiped out um many such cases a synced it native ruling classes couldn't fight bloodthirsty nomadic tribes that could seized power who horrifically repressed the civilizations and led them to decay one of the great mysteries of Western civilization's history is that the peasantries had never become pacified. In the Asian civilizations in the Roman Empire, the central provinces of the empire became useless fighters while the armies were recruited from barbarians on the edges of the frontier. This Hell never yeah. occurred in the West, with the English, Germans, and French remaining crack military fighters while never having to recruit, let's say, the Scots and Swiss to fight for them. This allowed the core Western nations to keep expanding while most of the other great empires would have resulted in stagnation. I've heard lots of possibilities for this, and I honestly don't know which of the options in front of you is the accurate one. I, I think... The other main contribution the Germans gave Western good. civilization was the obsession with legal rights and the origin of democracy. We generally have the idea that modern Western democracy came from the Greeks and the Romans, but this really wasn't the case. By the time the Roman Empire fell, it was an authoritarian, theocratic mess with no democracy at all. However, the Germanic tribes the belief that every member of the war band had friacht, or freedoms conferred on him as a man. These included legal freedoms and the right to elect the next king and leader of the war band. These rights stayed with the nobility who jealously guarded them throughout the Middle Ages. Something we often forget is that medieval Europe wasn't absolute kings ruling on a whim. Practically every kingdom in medieval Europe had a... Feudalism. Patronage. Shout out, Bakby. Parliament. It was with the invention of gunpowder and cannons that could knock down the nobility's castles that kings gained power over the nobilities and created absolute monarchies. The two states that didn't do this and in which the parliaments won out, Britain and the Netherlands, followed eventually by the United States, were so successful that people started to imitate them. The idea that Western democracy comes from the Greeks and Romans is a post-ad hoc thing, where these Enlightenment philosophers were trying to justify their democracies, it admired the Greeks and Romans and so drew the connection that wasn't there. A part of Germanic culture that became very important was their obsession with legal rights. Germanic moots or things, their terms for parliaments, had very complex representative systems for different social classes. As we'll see, this system was reinforced by the West's later history and evolved into personal and property rights, and this is a big reason why the Germanic countries are so wealthy now. The Catholic Church at the same time was doing what amounted to massive social engineering. One of the biggest things the Catholic Church accomplished in this era was the creation of the individual. For most of history, people lived inside clans. This makes sense. In a scary world, not having family to protect and support you is terrifying, and in a competitive world, the bigger the family, the better. 
Also, fun fact, we're genetically predisposed to breed with our third cousin since that's the perfect balance between breeding with someone similar to us so our genes are more likely to serve. I bet I thought diversity was our strength. Five, indifferent enough so that kids won't have deformities. Thus, the vast majority of marriages in history have been between certain degrees of cousins. Also, so that wealth and influence could stay inside the clan. For this reason, I'm founding a dating app with some friends matching up people who are between third and tenth cousins. However, the cat cousins. Okay, that's uh, that's it's classist or regionist or something. It's like racism. Catholic Church banned cousin marriage, and this quickly resulted in the destruction of clans. As with each generation, people left the clan. With the clan gone, the nuclear family became the center of life, and the individual the most important component of society. This sense of individual. To be honest, this was probably a. Um... This was a concerted effort, likely, um, and, and they probably would have tried to do it even before if they could. And the reason is that the Catholic Church or any church, they can take control, um, more control within something that's within their context. Then that means that they, as members of that social construct of leaders in it, then they get more authority just based on comparing, j just based on the comparison of their own culture to um, or or. Gosh, I'm really tired. I'm probably not even going to post this one, but I'll keep hanging out. Um, yeah. Individualism resulted in the West taking a very different moral framework from the rest of the world. In a lot of cultural psychology, it's a general truism that there's the world, and then the West is a freakish aberration. Of the West, America is normally the most aberrant, and Japan and Indonesia are normally the exact opposite of America on most metrics. The West became a guilt-based culture in which one's sense of morality was a personally driven practical relationship with God, or one's personal sense of morality. In the West, one is a bad person for not personally living up to moral standards like not having enough faith, not doing the right thing when alone, etc. The Western God is always watching you. The other Eurasian civilizations as a rule are generally shame-based, or you try to uphold the community's values. Thus, losing face is a horrific thing in China, since you're letting your whole clan down. In Afghanistan or Pakistan, honor killings, in which a male family member kills a girl for transgressing against some social norm, makes sense since killing her brings honor back to the family. In East Asia, your internal beliefs really don't matter that much. Following the proper Confucian rituals in public does. This sense of individualism also resulted in the West abolishing slavery very early inside Europe, being the only major civilization besides Zoroastrian Persia and Confucian China to do so. The Catholic Church abolished slavery, often working with local kings in the 11th century. Western Christianity has always been deeply uncomfortable with slavery, even though it has done some really horrific slavery in its time. However, when you compare it to a place like Islam, for example, who practiced the largest slave trade in history until the early 20th century, when the West forced them to end it, and still in real terms practices it in a lot of areas, and Christianity and Islam theologically aren't that different. Christianity is in a lot of ways a woman's religion. A big reason it became the dominant religion in the Roman Empire was that it appealed to women. Similarly, Western Christendom was the only major Eurasian civilization to not treat women horrifically starting in the early Middle Ages. Yeah. In Islam, Hindu, and Chinese civilization, right. upper-class women yeah. were kept in seclusion yeah. from society and given practically no legal rights. Horrific stuff like foot-binding occurred in China, while genital mutilation did in northeastern Africa, and widow-burning in India. In Latin Europe, meanwhile, women could own property, rule kingdoms, become religious leaders, and important writers. Another important shift was that the Catholic Church banned polygamy, which again was acceptable in the other major Eurasian civilizations, as well as divorce. Both of these raised the value of upper-class women, who had a monopoly on the family's reproductive success. Polygamy is also a perfect correlation with violence. Remember, for every girl that becomes a rich guy's fourth bride, there's more sexually frustrated young males who will commit more crimes and start a revolution. To be honest, polygamy wasn't widespread enough in the other Eurasian civilizations, normally being confined to the very upper classes to have these sort of delirious effects. For that sort of thing, you have to turn to places like Bantu Africa and some Native American tribes. The main survivor of the barbarian kingdoms was the Frankish Empire. However, the Frankish Empire had no bureaucratic structure, and so once it stopped having god-tier kings like Charlemagne, it collapsed. This opened up the West to attacks from all sides, namely Hungarians, Vikings, Muslims, and Slavs. The West faced several centuries of these deprivations and generally became the anvil from which a powerful offensive West was formed. To start with, 
The Muslim control of the Mediterranean from around 700 to 1000 was important because it split the Mediterranean into three. If the Muslim conquest never happened, you might have seen the center of the West remain around Italy and the Mediterranean. North Africa was very rich, and if the Muslim conquest never happened, it could have become a powerful center of Western society. Instead, Muslim pirates forced the center of Western civilization to move to the area around France, southern England, northern Italy, and the Rhineland. Similarly, it also cut the West off from the Eastern Roman Empire, thus accentuating the difference between Orthodox and Western civilization. The nations of the modern West formed to fight off these outside invaders. Spain and Portugal were frontier nations against the Muslims. France, England, and Scotland all formed on the frontier to fight against the Vikings. My Germany formed to fight off the Hungarian attacks, and the parts of Germany that turned out to Yours. To be important were those in the Hungarian frontier or Austria and the Slavic or Prussia. The pressure resulted in the West forming feudalism and knights. Since the central authority was so weak and the raiders were normally so fast, people turned to local leadership. These knights caged the peasantry and turned them into serfs under most circumstances. Each knight would build his own castle, which further accentuated the weakening of the central power system. However, and we often forget this today, feudalism was extremely effective. It protected the peasants and allowed economic and population growth, and the knights were the most effective warriors in the world, barring nomadic tribes like the Mongols. This allowed Western civilization to expand to a massive degree. In the years between 1000 and 1300, Western knight feudalism conquered most of the Iberian Peninsula, southern Italy, the Balkans, the Levantine coast, eastern Europe, Scandinavia.